phones on silent mode, that would be great. Uh, when we go to the questions, name and affiliation as always. Adam? Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you all for being here today. Um, we just finished two days of very productive meetings with our Board of Governors on, uh, frankly, a wide variety of topics. Um, enormous excitement around the beginning of the season. Training camps open in about 10 days, and the beginning of the season is in a month. There was um, one very serious topic, though, that was addressed, and I know a lot of you have questions about it today, and that's uh, the situation around uh, Robert Sarver in Phoenix. I did issue a statement yesterday, but let me just add a little to it now to say from a personal standpoint, um, I was, you know, I, you know, I was in disbelief to a certain extent about what I learned that had transpired over the last 18 years in the Suns organization. Um, I was saddened by it, disheartened. Um, I, I want to again apologize to the former, in some cases current, employees of the Phoenix Suns for what they had to experience. There's absolutely no excuse for it. Um, and we addressed it. Um, and, you know, I, I understand, I of course, have been following what's been said um, since we issued, you know, that, that, those findings. You know, let me reiterate, um, the conduct is indefensible, um, but I feel we dealt with it in a fair manner. In, in both taking into account um, the totality of the circumstances, not just those particular allegations, but the 18 years in which Mr. Sarver has owned the Suns and the Mercury. Um, but, you know, part of the goal in being transparent here, and that is in issuing a public report, of course, is so that whether it's the media or the public can draw their own conclusions um, in the same way I did. I will say, though, that what, what I have access to is a bit different than the public because while we issued this report um, in the process of doing the investigation, our, the outside counsel um, who, conducted this, who conducted this review um, committed to confidentiality um, to anyone who wanted it was the vast majority of those who were interviewed. Um, plus, they looked at um, cell phones, you know, something like 80,000 documents. And so I have access to information that the public doesn't. And, and again, that I'm able to look at the totality of the circumstances around those events in a way that doesn't, in a way that we're not able to completely bring to life the nuance that you see you know, around that, that when you read a report or deal with it as, as sort of in short bursts of news reporting. Um, and I think that, that's, that puts me in a different position, ultimately, as the person who has to render the ultimate judgment um, about what is a fair outcome here. So I, you know, I, again, um, I wish I could share that with all, all of you, but I can't because that was the condition on which um, this investigation was conducted. But with that, um, happy to answer any questions regarding um, the Sarver situation or anything else. All right, we'll start with the third row on the right here, Tim. Right there. Hey, Tim. Hi, Adam, Tim Reynolds, AP. In 2014, you said that because Mr. Sterling's remarks became public, that that changed things. That was essentially the game changer in that situation, or in, in some respect. It, it was a slippery slope, I think, was the term you used at the time. These remarks, while the quotes have not been made public, the gist of it is now out. How is this situation different, and did you consider a similar sanction this time as you did with, with, with Mr. Sterling? In, in the case of Donald Sterling, I don't remember my precise words back then, but I think the commentary around it becoming public didn't go to ultimately um, what the consequences should be. I think it was, it was more the nature of how we learned about it, how the public was aware of it um, in, in a time where um, the, what, the way it was disseminated so quickly over the internet. Um, and. I think there was, a, there was a, a, a realism to it, you know, that exists when you have audio of something that um, 
put, you know, back to my earlier comments, put everyone in essence in the same position I was in. We were all looking at the same record. Um, any, anyone who cared to listen to Donald Sterling's words. Um, this case is very different and it's, and that was what I was, I was commenting on earlier. It's not that one was captured on and the other isn't because as we went through this investigation and what was pointed out um, in the investigator's report is Mr. Sarver ultimately has acknowledged his behavior. Um, so there may be some d disagreement around the edges, but it's not really about a factual dispute here. It's not Mr. Sarver saying I never said that. What is lost though, and, and in the differentiating between the facts in this situation and Donald Sterling is the context. And I have available to me more of a context than the public can, and that's just the nature of it, because we have investigators who then can explain and if what they learned in 320 interviews and say, for example, well, the person was there and heard those words, but this is how they interpret them in that context. In the case of Sterling, we could all make our own judgments. But maybe then to go to your, really your ultimate question is, why the penalty in the case of Donald Sterling is different than, than Mr. Sarver. So I'd say number one, it was the same law firm, the same investigators, both who looked into the Sterling matters, looked into Sarver's matter, and ultimately the same legal office and the same ultimate judge. And for me, the situations were dramatically different. I think what, what we saw in the case of Donald Sterling was um, a blatant, um, blatant racist conduct um, directed um, at a select group of people. Um, and while it's difficult to know what is in someone's heart or in their mind, we heard those words and then there was a follow-up from the league office and that became public as well in terms of what Mr. Sterling even subsequently said about his actions. So in the case of Robert Sarver, I said, first of all, we're looking at the totality of circumstances over an 18 year period um, in which he's owned these teams. Um, and ultimately we made a, a judgment, I made a judgment that in the circumstances in which he had used that language and that behavior, that while, as I said, it was indes indefensible is, 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 is not strong enough. There's, it, it's beyond the pale in every possible way um, to use language and behave that way, but that it was wholly of a different kind than what we saw in that earlier case. And, and I also say that I would like to think that all of us would want to be judged in, by the totality of everything they've done, good and bad. It may be that in certain cases, something you've done is so bad, it doesn't matter what all the other good things you've done. But I think in this case, looking back over his track record of, of hiring, his track record um, of support of particular employees, what the actual people said about him. Remember, I mean, while there were these, these terrible things, there were also many, many people who had very positive things to say about him through this process. And ultimately, I took all of that into account in making the decision that the one year suspension plus the fine um, was appropriate. Second row in the middle, Howard. Howard Beck, Sports Illustrated. Hey, Adam. Um, Hey, two, two questions here. Uh, the report, the law firm concluded that the things that Robert Sarver did and said were, quote, without animus. So the first thing, I'm, I just wonder if you uh, agree with that assessment. But secondly, I think everybody in this room would agree that if any of us had said or done even a small percentage of the things that Robert Sarver has been shown to have said and done, we would be fired. And I assume that anybody working at Olympic Tower if they had done even a percentage of that, would be fired, and anybody who worked for any of your 30 teams would easily be fired. Why would there be a different standard, and understanding the complications of removing an owner, 
why should there be a different standard for the owner of an NBA team than there would be for everybody who works in this league? Fair question. I, I don't want to say you, you alluded to it, Howard, that there are particular rights here of someone who owns an NBA team as, to some, as opposed to somebody who's an employee. I, I, the equivalent of a $10 million fine and a one-year suspension, I don't know how to measure that against a job, but I have certain authority by virtue of this organization and that's what I exercised. Um, I don't have the right to take away his team. I don't want to rest on that neat legal point because, of course, there could be a process to take away someone's team in this league. It's very involved. And I ultimately made the decision that it didn't rise to that level. But to me, the consequences are severe here on Mr. Sarver. Reputationally, it's hard to even make those comparisons to somebody who commits an inappropriate act in the workplace in somewhat of an anonymous fashion versus what is a, a huge public issue now ar around this person. So the, there's no neat answer here. I mean, it's other, other than owning property, the rights that come with, with, with owning an NBA team, um, you know, how that's set up within our constitution, um, what it would take to Remove that team, you know, from his control is a very involved process, and it's different than holding a job. It just is when 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 you actually um, own a, a team. It's a, it's it's just a very different proposition. Second row, the right, Tanya. Uh, Tanya Ganguly, New York Times. Um, okay. Was there any discussion today about the process of removing him as owner? There was no discussion around the, the process of removing him. There was a discussion around um, this case. Okay. And then um, I wanted to kind of follow up on what Howard was asking. Um, you know, this report found Sarver saying, I hate diversity, specifically in reference to racial diversity. They confirmed several accounts of Sarver being disrespectful to black employees and those employees feeling like that was race-based. Um, repeated uses of the N-word despite people telling him that he couldn't say that. How does all that taken together not represent race-based animus? Number one, and I, I, I should have said this in response to Howard's question as well, I, I was not the fact finder here. I mean, the Wachtell firm conducted the 320 interviews and ultimately um, made their conclusions. I will say, I think that that's a, in some ways, a legal distinction. I think what, as I interpreted their report to be saying, that we are not able to conclude, based on the context of those statements, that they were, they were said out of racial animus. I think they're also, they are in essence saying that we do not know what is in his heart or in um, ultimately his mind, but that in the broader context of him saying those things, as foolish as it was for him to say that, as indefensible for him to say that, we do not find that, that the motivation in those instances of saying those things was based on race. But that is their finding. And, and again, they have the benefit of the larger context of doing those interviews, of, of seeing the full context in which those things were said. So I understand the inference that can be drawn from those things, but they, but they ultimately found there was insufficient evidence to make those findings. Third row in the middle, Tim. Hey, Adam. Tim Bonas from ESPN. Two things quick. Uh, in there, just to read it, the investigation made no finding that Mr. Sarver's workplace misconduct was motivated by a racial or gender-based animus. Do you believe that there, that is the case, you personally? I, I accept their work. I mean, it, for to, to follow what we believe is appropriate process here, to, have, to bring in a law firm, to have them spend essentially nine months on this, to do the extensive kinds of interviews they can. I'm not able to put myself in their shoes. I respect the work they've done. We've done, worked with them in the past. Um, they're, they're very good at what they do. They're very experienced at what they do. So the fact is, I, I am given a factual record, and then I make determinations based on that. So I do accept what they found. And, and did that factor into that that line in the report, did, how much of a factor did that play into your decision on ter in terms of what the punishment was? It was relevant. I mean, I, I think if they had made findings um, that 
In fact, his conduct was motivated by racial animus, absolutely. That would have had an impact on our ultimate, um, on the ultimate outcome here, but that's not what they found. Just one thing very quickly, to follow up on Tanya's question about uh, discussion of removal, did back in when you guys had the situation with the Hawks several years ago, there were discussions with them, ultimately Bruce Levinson sold the team. Were there any discussions with Robert Sarver during this process about voluntarily selling the Suns? No. I, uh, the discussions, we, we, Robert Sarver and I spoke several times along the way, and I, we allowed, I allowed the investigation to unfold. We didn't prejudge it. And just to be clear, in, in the case of Atlanta, there was not a discussion there about um, a forced sale of the team. Ultimately, um, Mr. Levinson chose to sell his team, but that, that was not at the request of the league. Yeah, yeah, no. Third row, Mike. Hey, Adam, Mike Borknoff, uh, hey, Mike. The Athletic. Uh, I just want to ask, um, and I'm reading to make sure I have the details right, uh, if an owner is found by a league investigation to have repeatedly used racist language, demeaned women, bullied employees, uh, twice used nudity to embarrass employees, and, quote, believed the workplace norms did not apply to him, unquote, uh, and ran an organization that had a hostile workplace and was found to be discriminatory towards women, um, and he's allowed to retain ownership of the franchise, where does the NBA draw the line as to who they believe should no longer be allowed to own and run a team? There is not a bright line in terms of ownership, and I wouldn't want to create one to suggest people could go right up to it. I think every one of these situations is going to be different. They're going to be fact-based, and as I said, I think you have to look at the totality of circumstances. You're looking at behavior over an 18-year period. I do believe that Mr. Sarver clearly um, has evolved as a person over that 18-year period. I think much of the behavior in question stems from much earlier in his tenure as an NBA owner. And I, I think what your, your litany leaves out are many very positive things he did as well, and also leaves out how those events were characterized by those people who are directly involved in them and how they describe them to the investigators. So I, I recognize that the, the point, as I said earlier, of transparency in a report like this is so you in the media or our fans can also look directly at that report and draw their own conclusions, as your question suggests, um, others can. And so I accept that. And I, I would only say in the situation for me, looking at the totality, looking at um, what Mr. Sarver's rights are as an owner, looking at what um, the options were available to me, thought I came out with the right outcome. Second row on the left, Steve. Uh, Steve Ashburner, NBA.com. Hey, Steve. Adam, uh, your realm is professional sports where historically things have gotten profane, things have gotten vulgar, insulting. This has gone on from the ownership level down through executives, through coaches, managers, players, even fans. As you look at all that and the context in which this particular chapter has played out, do you, do you see any ripple effect, uh, any message uh, up and down the, uh, the pecking order, I guess, in terms of you know, what people need to be mindful of, what's acceptable, the best ways to pursue these type of things so they don't build up over 18 years? Steve, so I think, one, I think how you're describing the environment that many of us have worked in in professional sports is, is accurate. And I think that part of, I think, when you're doing a workplace investigation like this, I think what the investigators are looking at and the environment in which some of this language is used and the context it's being used. And often it is a profane environment where language is being bantered about, et cetera. So I'm, I'm, I... I think that as they interviewed the witnesses, that's the, sort of the context that's missing when you sort of pull the words out in a certain way. But at the same time, um, through my several decades now at the league, you know, we've tried you know, at, at every opportunity to improve the environment around the team, the league office for that matter. Um, you know, most recently, around 2018, we made a decision that our current practices were insufficient across all 30 teams. For example, we installed 
um, a hotline, an anonymous hotline, to the extent there was untoward activity at Teams or people felt that things were happening that were inappropriate, that they had a sounding board outside of um, their own human resources department at the team, viewing these as league-wide issues. Um, uh, you know, we added a, a chief diversity and inclusion officer at the league. We've become much more focused on these topics at our league meetings, on the data from our teams, on our hiring practices. And I believe we've seen significant improvement over the years. I think what this, even in the case of the Phoenix Suns, looking back over the 18 years, to a certain extent, you can see the evolution of how things have improved around the league. Um, the, but you know, ultimately, I think some of the issues we experience here um, in the NBA are not all that different than what you see, unfortunately, in other workplaces. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to say we've turned the corner. We clearly haven't. You know, as, as I said, I, I, you know, I, I can't express it in strong enough terms how disheartening it is to be the commissioner of a league and where this kind of conduct has transpired during my tenure. Um, and you know, it's, it's my hope, at least, that what part of what we can learn from all this is that, to the extent there are employees um, or anywhere um, at, a, at, a, at a team in the league or at the league office, for that matter who feel that they're being treated improperly or in a discriminatory fashion, that they know they are outlets and they will be heard and they will be taken seriously. Um, and, and, and we'll try to continue to improve. Back row in the middle, Jabari. Jabari Young Forbes, hi Adam. Um, have you heard from any players over the last 24 hours? And if so, uh, but I don't want you to go into detail about the privacy of those conversations, but can you kind of explain or describe the emotion if you have heard from any of those players? Yeah, I, thanks, Jabari. Um, yes, I've talked to some players, um, you know, and those have been private conversations. Uh, I think um, I, I'll leave it for the, the players um, to to speak directly how they feel. I would only say I, you know, I I think disheartening. Um, same reaction I've had in many cases. I, you know, I, I think these are. You know, it's it. I, I think sad, saddened, as you know, as I was. I think for those players to see that we are we continue to deal with these issues. I think it's look. It's it's no secret. We you know, um, this is a league where you know roughly 80 percent of our players are, are are black. You know, more than half our coaches are black. It's it's. Um, I will say that none of them maybe are as shocked as I am, living their lives, that I don't think they're reading this saying, oh my God, I can't believe this happens. But uh, at the same time, you know, I, I think they look to the league, look to the partnership that the league has with the Players Association to see how can we do better? How can we improve things? I think, look, I don't want it to be lost. There's so much I'm proud about in terms of this league, particularly on these issues. And I think one of the things that makes it so painful for me, you know, when I'm, when I, even the questions you're asking me today and, and to read um, the report is to think about how much this league means, has meant in the African-American community, how much um, progress we've made in terms of women's sports, the WNBA, um, and you know, I was up at the Hall of Fame on Saturday night listening like, to Swin Cash and some of those great you know, speeches that the inductees were given about the meaning of this game and, and, and these leagues and how we've... Um, transform people's lives and the impact we've had on society, and then something like this happens, and you're disgusted by it. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we um, were able to be transparent about this. I'm certainly, we're not hiding from this. We recognize it's, it, it happened. It, it happened in our league. I accept and understand that some people um, disagree um, with what the ultimate consequences were for Mr. Sarver, and I'm also hopeful that Mr. Sarver uses this time um, to not just express his remorse, but demonstrate it. He, you know, he, just to be clear, I mean, he is precluded from doing anything in the NBA or the WNBA, but he's not being censured in terms of his opportunity to, to do good things, you know, with, with his year away from the league or for the rest of his life, for that matter. Um, I, I do hope that 
um, people in the league, even to, to Steve's earlier question, that people come away from this and refocus on these issues, on the impact of language. Sometimes I think in sports, it's, it's a little bit of the context of this that, you know, sort of the, the sort of notion of like the locker room, what, you know, what, the way people talk to each other, um, this the sort of the testosterone around the NBA that people realize that, that language can be incredibly um, hurtful to people, uh, you know, and that, and that their behavior, while maybe they have no racist intent behind it or misogynistic intent, that that's not how it may be um, interpreted or felt by the person who's on the receiving end. And it's, it's clear to me that as much as this league does, we have to do even more to make sure everyone is educated top to bottom in our organizations to understand um, the impact of their behavior. Second row on the right, Tanya. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the investigative team. Um, how, do you know how many women and black people were part of that group? I know it was a very diverse team. I know um, there were, um, I believe, two black males who worked on the team. I, there were two women who worked on the team. I don't have the full scope, but it, I, I know it was a diverse team. Um, I knew that I know that was important to Wachtell as well that when they were embarking on this investigation They wanted to make sure that many different perspectives were represented in the room. And how big is the the full group? Um, I Believe it was roughly around five people, but um, we could get that precise answer for you Third row on the right Tim Adam, it all pales, obviously to the news, but while we have you you guys have been up here for three long days what uh, and were there any updates on CBA negotiations and season tournament? Any any other league business of note transpiring from this? Um, there were updates on all those topics. Um, you know, I, I, I'll put um, collective bargaining to the side um, for a moment. But um, you know, we continue to discuss the notion of an in-season tournament potentially as soon as next season. Um, as I've said before, it's something that I, I, I remain excited about. I think it's. Or, uh, it continues to be an opportunity within the current footprint of our season to create um, some more meaningful games, um, games of consequence um, during an otherwise long regular season. Um, I, I think as we continue to discuss this opportunity with our players and our teams, I think the more excitement is built. I think the, the group um, at the NBA, led by Byron Spruell, um, it, you know, has um, you know, continued to refine the plan it's gotten some great feedback from both um, the players, the Players Association directly. I mean, it still would need to be something ultimately um, agreed to in collective bargaining, but um, it's, it's not quite ready for prime time yet. Um, but, but I'm excited about it. I, th I, think, I think fans might really ultimately enjoy another competition during the season, some sort of cup competition, certainly not rising to the level of the Larry O'Brien trophy, but yet something else significant to play for. All right, we're going to take two more in the second row in the middle. Howard. Thanks. Um, Adam, just back to Sarver for a second. I understand that $10 million is the max that you were uh, permitted to, to uh, find an owner. On the suspension part, do you have the option, did you have the option for going further than one year? And if so, um, how do you settle on one year? And then related to that, based on some of the reporting and even based on some of the things that Robert Sarver's own statement yesterday that he seems perhaps less than fully repentant on some of this? What assurance is there that when he returns a year from now that he does not engage in some of the same behavior that we've just been reading about? Um, to your first question, I, I had the option to go longer. Um, I landed on one year. I will say it's the second um, longest suspension um, in the history of our league. So just to put it in some sort of context, um, in terms of his level of remorse, at least as expressed directly to me, he was taking complete accountability and seemed fully remorseful. I recognize, I think, what he was saying in the report itself, I think he may take issues around um, a certain particular context of how what things were said or, or particular activities, but He's not the finder of fact, Wachtell was, and I accept that. Um, in terms of future behavior, um, there's no question 
he's on notice. Um, he knows that. And I, and I also think, though, if you look at the chronology of the sort of the report, is that most of this activity goes back many, mo most of the um, inappropriate activity goes back many years. I would say the son's workplace is um, a very different environment today, even at the beginning of, of this investigation than it was years ago. I don't think there's any dispute over that. You know, new human resources people, professional people coming in, many people who were once with the organization who frankly were part of the problem are no longer there. So, but, but you know, this is, every day is a new day. I mean, that, that it's, it's not as if we're, we've closed the book. We've closed the book on these historic um, um, incidents, but um, anything going forward, I don't think there's any question that he, he will be scrutinized in terms of his behavior and speech. Final question, third row in the middle, Mike. Yeah, Adam, I just have two questions I'm gonna squeeze in in artfully, one Sarver, one not. Um, firstly, uh, the non-Sarver question, what is the um, standing on the investigations into the Sixers and Knicks? Like, what, what prompted all of that as well? The, the status of those investigations, they're ongoing, you know, hopefully they'll be wrapped up in the next few weeks. I think what, what prompted them was the sort of just the, the tick-tock chronology around sort of when signings are permissible and the announcements of those signings and the information that came out about them, which was cause for the league office to investigate. Not a complaint from a team? No. Okay. Uh, and the second one about Sarver, um, there was, I believe in the report, there, it said that there was an email from him to someone at the league office in October 2016 where he used uh, the N-word. Did you or anyone at the league office know about his conduct, behavior, um, before the ESPN report in November 2021? No. Um, his, that behavior had never been reported to us before. I think the, again, context is so important in, in, in all of these cases. And the context of an email to the league office was one in which he was reporting about particular behavior of a player on the floor. And, and again, I, I, that, that's why these situations become so complicated, because I think we all recognize that, um, you know, in terms of the use of language, that in order to properly interpret it and, and to have a sense of um, what the motivation is for using it, we have to look at the totality of circumstances. But, um, you know, incidentally, I, I had mentioned that the hotline before, there had, not, there had not been complaints to the league office directly about uh, inappropriate behavior at the Phoenix Suns or about Mr. Sarver prior to um, the publishing of that ESPN article. All right, thanks, Adam. And thanks for all for being here. We will have transcripts available up on Media Central uh, within the next couple hours. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.